Happy Sabbath. If you are visiting with us today, this is a time in our worship service where we share some of the activities and programs that are happening here at the Loma Linda University Church. And first off, we just want to remind all of you that there is a mission trip to Cuba that is next year, June 18 through the 30th. It will be with our church partnering with Quiet Hour Ministries under the leadership of Pastor Roy Ice. Now, if you want to go, you'll need to sign up quickly, though, because there is a maximum of 25 people. So some of the things that you will be participating in if you go on this trip are evangelism, medical and eye clinics. There will also be programs for children and construction. So if this is of interest to you, check out our church website. Tonight is our annual Candlelight Christmas concert. Now that begins at 6 o'clock tonight, and we just want to remind you that there will be no tickets sold at the door tonight and there is no will call. So make sure you have your tickets prior to coming this evening. And also next week, December the 22nd, is Lessons of Carols. Now this is an annual uh, Vespers program that is the week before Christmas. There will be stories and carols sung and different readings. So we invite you out at 4.30 here in the sanctuary. And also in regards to our family up in paradise, if you would like to get involved and help in any way, check out our church website. And again, if you are visiting with us today, there is a Uconnect card in the seat in front of you. Fill that out and let us know ways that we can help you or go out to the Uconnect Center in the foyer and there is someone who would love to talk to you there. On behalf of our whole pastoral staff, everyone here at Media, and everyone behind the scenes, we hope that you have a fantastic Sabbath day.
Good morning. I welcome you all to the Loma Linda University Church. Extend a warm welcome to those that are viewing online or via our LLBN broadcast. As we continue our Advent series this month, we hope that we would all, through the lineage of Jesus, see that no one, for any reason, is an outsider, but that in Christ all belong to the family of God. Can you say amen? This evening, we have our annual Christmas concert. For those of you that plan to attend, the doors will be opening at 5.30. We're asking that you would primarily park uh, behind either the School of Dentistry or behind Mortensen Hall. And we'll have the golf cart ministry available there to shuttle anyone that needs a ride to the sanctuary. At this time, I'm going to ask if you would join me in standing as we together Join in for a responsive reading. O come to the water, all you who are thirsty. And though you have no money, come, buy corn without money, and eat, and at no cost, wine and milk. Why spend money on what is not bread? your wages on what fails to satisfy. Behold, wise men from the east came in search of him. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. See, You will summon a nation you never knew. Those unknown will come hurrying to you. For the sake of Yahweh, your God, of the Holy One of Israel, who will glorify you. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who had heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Remain standing, please, as we let out that joy that is in our hearts from that great land.
Let us pray. Father, we come before, before you here today. Lord, we want to say thank you, Father. Thank you because you have been so good to us as we contemplate this year, God, as we contemplate the many mercies, the many grace, the many love that you've shown upon us, God. We can say, but thank you. Lord, as we've come into this place, we've come here to worship you. And Lord, we're reminded of this God who loves to come closest to us. You're Emmanuel, the God who is with us. And Lord, as families gather around this season of the year, God, as families come back together, Lord, I thank you so much for the joy that that brings to our hearts. I thank you for the amazing God that you are that gives us the intentionality to continue to grow in this community of faith. Lord, I pray also, Father, for the many families that are going through many difficult moments, whether it's financial moments, whether there's battles in the home, whether there's anything happening, God, I pray for your spirit to be upon that. God, I pray for you to give us hearts of grace and mercy, Lord. Thank you so much for who you are. Lord, I pray for the people right across from us, God, the hospital, the many people that cry out to you in their agony and pain. Lord, may we be that community as well that lends a helping hand and be there for those. Thank you so much for who you are. And thank you so much for this season that we're reminded of your love and grace. In Jesus' name, together we all say, amen. This morning, let's try something a little bit different. I know this song is particularly meaningful for me. I remember sitting around at family worships around the Christmas season and uh, singing this in both English and German um, with my family growing up. Perhaps some of you know it in a different language as well. So uh, as we sing this first verse, I invite you to sing in whatever language you might be most comfortable in singing this beautiful Christmas carol. Pastor Doug, what an exciting day. We've been looking forward to this for some time. It is exciting. Friends, this is what we have been talking about for so long. This Sabbath has been set aside months ago as the day we coordinate our giving. We coordinate our gifts to God on behalf of the New Family Ministries building. We're joined by our head elder and board chair, Richard Bloom Johnston and Kurt Campbell, and they're holding up the model. And friends, plans, plans that were once on paper are now still anchored to concrete. As you can see in the pictures above, this building is getting done so ever fast. 
Uh, you can see there that these pictures are already out of date. I took them on Tuesday, and they're already out of date because mm -hmm. they've, in, they've enclosed with the vertical steel. You can actually see the full perimeter now if you go out there and take a look. We have floors on much of the first floor uh, already established, that corrugated floor for the lightweight concrete. You see the basement there with our, uh, our administrator, Tim like Rossum. we got some rain, Doug. We got a lot of mud. You'll see that the <laughs> mud is down there. We're hoping it dries out in time, but that hasn't slowed them down much at all. This is where the media, our world-class media, will have its studios in that, uh, it looks like a vault now, but those are the walls already in the basement. Friends, do you realize that we will likely, and they get me in trouble when I say this, but likely celebrate Thanksgiving in our new building. Can I get an amen? Amen. This is That's just fantastic. <laughs> December 15, though, we've designated as the day that we coordinate our giving. We bring an offering that we have prayed about, that we've talked about. My family and I talked about how much will be a part of our special offering, even though we hope that everyone's involved with uh, giving throughout the year. We have much to celebrate, friends. I hope that you signed the beam as you walked in. I couldn't believe the, uh, the party in the lobby. There were a lot of people signing. That, it's just beautiful. I, I want to put it up uh, and frame it. I don't want to put it into the building. It's so beautiful. I saw a really big seat. Was that your? That wasn't really? mine. That wasn't yours? That wasn't mine, <laughs> but I followed that person home. <laughs> we're excited that you're here, and this day has been set aside for us to come together, and I'm really looking forward. Let me just say this with all humility. First service offering was wonderful. Amen. And we're so very thankful. Doug, I am continually amazed by the generosity of this church family. We're so profoundly grateful to you on a variety of different fronts. Let me say, for example, that your response to the Paradise Fire and the need there has been stunning. We'll say more about that as the weeks go by, but there's much that we can draw on there to be of help with people who are facing serious and significant need. Your response to the UREACH, our outreach program of University Church this year, has been a banner year. I'm so thankful for a community whose hearts beat with the desire to help those who are underprivileged and who need our help. We thank you for that so much. It allows us to do ministry in ways we otherwise could not. And then today we're focusing on our building. And again, I just have to say, even throughout this last week, we have been the recipients here at the church of your gifts, large and small, and every gift matters. Amen. We so deeply appreciate the fact that many are giving as they are able. That means there's a widespread support a collegiality about this program, and for that we're profoundly grateful. And we're very grateful to those of you whom God has blessed in a specific way, and you're able to give larger gifts. Just know that God sees every gift, values every gift, and that we are appreciative for each and every single one. So today, when the offering comes, will be the time you can put your gift in the offering, but I would remind you of this. If you want your gift to go specifically to the building fund, you'll need to slip it in an envelope and write that it's for the building fund. The loose offerings will go to our church budget, which we always appreciate as well. But today, since this is a special time, this is a special focus in our life as a community and a family, we'd like to pray together before we take the offering. And I want to invite you, if you're able, to join us to kneel with us as we pray. Gracious God, we kneel here this morning in worship. We kneel as your grateful children, children upon, you, upon whom you have poured the riches of heaven. We always thank you, in the words of the Apostle Paul, for your unspeakable gift, the gift Jesus Christ. This time of year, our thoughts especially turn to that gift. Amen. But Lord, we thank you for so many other gifts as well. Thank you that you've given us the privilege of giving. You know that we never want to forget those who are needy, those that we can serve, and we continue to do that. But we also want to think about the coming generations of this church, about our building project, about the dream of what can be done here as we grow disciples together for the kingdom of God. Amen. 
So, Lord, move upon our hearts in the ways that you might wish for us to give, and then bless us deeply for having given. And for all of these things, we will thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. We invite you to sing along as the deacons wait upon us. And so it is during this season that the world shifts away from its obsession to consume, its narrative of degradation, and its constant search for power. And it orients its attention to a small hamlet in Judea, to a manger, and to a baby born to teen parents. That is why the story of Christmas is so beautiful because at its heart, it's all about a baby. A baby who was born to transform history. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Romans equates baptism with rebirth. And so it is our privilege and pleasure to rejoice during this Advent season and to celebrate three spiritual births. So I am joined first in the, in the baptistry by Jessica. And if I were to search for one question that describes Jessica, it would be consistency. You see, Jessica works night shifts, and she works in a particular profession that requires interaction with people. 
I don't know how many of you have interacted with someone at 2 a.m. demanding something, but it can be rather taxing. And after a long shift, to come and discuss and ask questions about Scripture would be a tall order. Friends, do you know Jessica didn't miss one meeting? She fell asleep sometimes, <laughs> but she didn't miss one meeting. Jessica, this is your family. Here at the Loma Linda University Church, we are committed to the task of building and growing disciples, and it is such a pleasure to begin this rebirth, this discipleship journey with you. Now, Jessica hails from Chicago, and there are several people here from Chicago who are just enjoying our wonderful weather. Jessica is accompanied by friends and family, so at this time I would ask you to stand and support this decision. Thank you. You may be seated. And now, Jessica, because you have decided to arrange a room for Jesus in your heart, because you have decided to let him dwell in you, because you wish to be a disciple and enjoy life with him, and because you are waiting excitedly for that room he has gone to prepare for you in heaven, it is my pleasure to now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Jessica didn't come alone. Jessica came with Amaya. And Amaya has this particular talent. She can ask questions that are both poignant and profound. One of the things I love about her is this exuberance and the zest she brings to our discussions. And more than that, she, her passion, this unbridled passion to sing. Well, today, in this beautiful Advent season, we celebrate a song, the song that the shepherds sang. And Amaya, it is my hope that in this community, you are able to find the notes to a new song. Now, Amaya has also friends and family that have come to support this decision, and so I would ask you at this moment to stand. Thank you, you may be seated. Hosanna in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Amaya, because you have decided that that will be the song that serves as the melody for your life, because you have decided to give your heart to the babe in the manger, and because you wait for the moment when you will be able to sing a new and exciting song, it is my pleasure and privilege now to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is a very special Sabbath for many reasons, but not the least of which is the choices of young people to follow Jesus their whole life. I am with Subin Jun, and Subin is very influential with many of her friends. She has a ton of friends, and she, she comes to church regularly, and she is a leader in the junior high leadership program. And Subin has brought great joy to my heart because I see her use her influence on behalf of Jesus Christ and this church. Amen? I see her already making a difference for the world. She's changing it in the way of love. 
and I love that about Subin. I want her friends and family. She has a big fan club right here in the front. These are friends of hers that just love her and want to support her. Anyone else that is family or friends, please stand. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I, uh, I often ask these junior high kids, now remind me, why are you getting baptized today? Just before we come out here. And Subin said, without missing a beat, God has done so much for me. I want to declare my love for him openly and live for him. Can I get another amen? amen. And I told her that today there will be witnesses to her testimony in through baptism that will give their lives to Jesus because of what she has done. This will mark the beginning of a large group of junior high kids who have all decided to get baptized in this season, which I love. I think it's because family's in town and that kind of thing, but we are so excited about young people who, not, who have not only given their heart to Jesus, but have become leaders in this university church, and I am so proud of them, and I'm proud of Subin. So Subin, because you want to give your life to Jesus and follow him all the days of your life, and because you want to declare your love for Jesus Christ, it gives me great joy to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me just say, as a youth pastor, that is the greatest joy ever. If you, too, want to pursue Jesus through baptism, won't you let one of us know? Thank you so much.
Today, on this th third Sabbath of Advent, we receive a gift, Ruth's gift. She was different. She was from a different land, a different language, a different culture with different gods. She didn't belong. All she had was a love for and loyalty to family. And that love and loyalty carried her into the land of Judah. Naomi wished her well, knowing that a brighter future could be found elsewhere. But Ruth, well, Ruth stayed. Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Where does this journey of this immigrant take us? What will 23 and Jesus and me offer us? Does the incarnation of Jesus offer a way to move from rejection to acceptance? What is it? It looks like wheat. Thank you very much. I much appreciate Ruth's gift, sheaves of wheat. Because Ruth's gift, gift has something very special and real for us today. But to understand Ruth's gift, we may need to begin in the modern day. We need to begin with a trip. A trip some of you participated in about a year and a half ago. It's a trip to Europe to trace some of the footsteps of the Reformers. We had the opportunity and the privilege to be at some of those sites where some of those remarkable events took place that were characterized as the Protestant Reformation. We were one day in the small town of Eisleben. Eisleben is an important town because it was there that the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther was born. But it was also there that Martin Luther drew his last breaths. So it's an important place. Not a big place, maybe 26,000 population. But it was something not directly related to the Reformation that caught my attention that day, walking down the sidewalk. Because walking down the sidewalk, unless you were careful, you could actually stumble over a plaque. There were some plaques at different places in the sidewalk falling right in front of the doorways to the homes that bordered the street very closely. They were raised just a bit, not much, just a bit, just enough to catch the edge of your shoe if you weren't observant. They were called, in fact, stumbling stones. Uh, there was a man in 1996 who began to put the stumbling stones in Berlin without permission from the city. He just began to dig little holes and put them in there, place them at certain key locations throughout the city. He was a man interested in history, interested in what had transpired in Europe as a whole, in Germany specifically in the 30s and 40s. His name was Gunter Demnig. Dignig was placing these stones as memorials, memorials to Jewish people who had been taken from these homes to their deaths. Dimnig wanted them to be remembered, not forgotten. He started what has now become known as the, most, the largest decentralized monument in the world. He researched, found the names, the dates of birth, the time when they were deported, the date of death, where that occurred, and he engraved these on these bronze-looking plaques that, the, that he then places in the sidewalk. So I want to show you just a little bit about Eisleben. I'll show you, first of all, a picture of the city street in Eisleben. As you look at that city street, you can understand why it would feel like, like being in the 1940s. doesn't take much imagination to put yourself back in that place and that time probably hasn't changed all that much since then. 
But then you start noticing these plaques. You can see one there in the sidewalk in front of that red doorway. After I'd walked past one or two and slightly tripped on one, I'm sure, I became interested. Here was one in front of the Jewish synagogue. What exactly are they? And what do they say? And so I took some pictures. In front of one house is this one. The top line says, Here Lived. And then follows the name. Eric Rosenthal, Flory Rosenthal. JG stands for their date of birth. So Eric was born in 1886. Flory was born in 1903. Bit of an age gap there. Mom and dad were a little concerned. But they got married. Under Flory's name, the G-E-B stands for her maiden name. So she was a Barnett. And then comes the same word on both, deported. Deported in 1944, the name of the place to which they were deported, that name that will live in infamy, Auschwitz. So in 1944, Eric and Flory Rosenthal banished to Auschwitz. And then one more word, immordate, which literally translated means murdered. Eric was murdered November 10 of 1944. Flory in October of 1944. Just a couple gone. There was another one. This is Hedwig and Gustav Mosbach. She was a block growing up, only about three years apart, both deported in 1942, both deported to Sobibor. They both died on the same day. One would assume as soon as they entered the camp, March 6, 1942. And one more. One more, this one of the Konigsberger family, three of them, Dr. Ludwig Konigsberger, his wife Jenny. They were deported in 1942 also to Sobibor, along with their daughter Marietta, and also died March 6, 1942. What a day! in Sobibor. And so Dimnig does his work, working from city to city, sidewalk to sidewalk, house to house. It was a deeply sobering experience to stand there in front of those doorways and to allow one's imagination to picture the scene. Was it from this very place that they were wrenched from life? pulled away from everything that made life near and dear to them, told they were going to work at a camp, and taken to their deaths. It happened because of their heritage, their lineage, because of the blood coursing through their veins, because of who they were. Just that. Just being alive and being a person of Jewish descent. That's all it took. Interestingly, I have read some research just recently, been happening in the last decade or two, some research following the same kind of thinking pattern of 23andMe, some work that have been, has been done with the relatives of Adolf Hitler, a cousin here, some relatives there, putting together a picture of his lineage, of his heritage. There is a case to be made, it seems to me a fairly strong case, that Hitler himself had some Jewish blood running through his body. Unbelievable. Trying to do away with a group of people of which he may well have been a part. It's a tragic reality. It's a tragic reality that history's face is pockmarked with the dictators and the despots who have wanted to do away with others. But it is not contained only in the dictator's heart or mind. You know as well as I do that from our youngest years, from our days on the playground, all the way up through our adult years and our professional lives, we so easily draw those lines of distinction between us and them, the ones who are part of the in-group and the ones that are not. 
We are the ones that belong. You go somewhere else. And too often it has to do with heritage. Who people are, in some cases, over which they have no control. In other cases, they may have made choices along the way. But we're good at drawing those lines. And that's where we come to a story. A story of a woman named Ruth. A story of a woman and some sheaves of wheat. And a distant past and a new future. But if you want to understand the story of Ruth, you actually have to back up several decades. You have to get the right background if you understand the reality of what happened in her life. So back up some decades from when Ruth lived all the way back to the time of Moses. Moses is coming toward the end of his life. He has led the people out of slavery in Egypt. And now they have come to the borders of the promised land, a promised land into which he himself will not be able to lead them. And so toward the very end of his life, Moses stands and delivers three sermons. Sermons that are recorded in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. And it is buried in one of those sermons that we find a backdrop for, for Ruth that is disturbing. Moses says to the people, you are never to allow an Ammonite or a Moabite into the assembly of God's people. They are never to be allowed. He doesn't use exactly the word never. He says, unto the tenth generation, which would have been code word for never. Don't ever allow them in. Well, why not, Moses? Well, what goes unsaid that day, but was true, was that the Ammonites and the Moabites were two tribes that were descended from the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. Moses doesn't give that as a reason in that case, but it hangs there unsaid in the air. Moses instead gives two other reasons. First of all, he says, when we came out of Egypt, we were making our way across the wilderness. They refused to help us to come to our aid. Now that's easy to think that's not really a big deal until you remember the reality of that land in that culture. Because of the desolate nature of the land, hospitality was deeply needed and highly valued. You helped the traveler that needed help. That was just the bottom line. And Moses says, they wouldn't do it. But the second reason he gives, and this one deeper, he says, not only would they not come to our aid, but they hired Balaam to try to bring the curse of God down upon us. Now, admittedly, Balaam didn't succeed at the beginning, but what he did do is he made a suggestion that ended up leading the people astray and suffering under the punishment of God and headed back into the wilderness for several more decades of wilderness wanderings. And so Moses stands up and says, no one, no Ammonite, no Moabite will ever be allowed into the assembly of the people of God. And the decades pass. And another story begins. This begins with a man and a woman, Elimelech and Naomi living in the land of Israel during a very difficult time. They are experiencing a devastating famine, and it is also a morally turbulent time. It was the time of the judges. So Naomi and Elimelech decide, we've got to go somewhere else. We may not survive here in this country. So they left, and they went to the country of Moab. Moab, the same Moab. Maybe here we can find life. Things did not go well for Elimelech and Naomi. You know what happens. The kids grow up. They get to know their neighbors and friends, classmates, and pretty soon they're falling in love with a Moabite. And that's what happens. I'd like to just read you the words of, of two Bible scholars, George Knight and James Edwards, as they 
Give us a thumbnail sketch of the story of Ruth. The reason I chose to read this was they highlight, they underline the significance of the names of both people and places, which give us an insight into what happened in the story. So listen to Knights and Edwards' words. The story begins with a famine in Israel, a sign of disobedience and apostasy. An Israelite named Elimelech, my God is king, in a desperate act moves from Bethlehem, house of bread, note the irony, to Moab. Although he seeks life in that land, he and his two sons, Malon, sick, you imagine naming your son that, sick, <laughs> and Killian, pining, find only death. The deceased sons leave two Moabite widows, Orpah, stubbornness, and Ruth, friendship. Elimelech's widow, Naomi, hears that the famine in Israel is over and decides to return, no longer as Naomi, pleasant, but as Mara, bitter. She tells her daughters-in-law to remain in Moab and remarry. Orpah chooses to leave Naomi and is never mentioned again. Ruth, on the other hand, resolves to cling to Naomi and follow Yahweh, the God of Israel. She therefore gives up her culture, people, and language because of her love. In Israel... Naomi must let Ruth glean at the edge of a field. That's the only way they can eat. The stalks that she gleaned. God's providential care brings her to the field of Boaz, Naomi's kinsman. Boaz, in him as strength, begins to love, protect, and provide for her. Boaz, though, takes no steps toward marriage. So Naomi follows the accepted customs of the day and requests that Boaz exercise his right as kinsman redeemer. God rewards Ruth's devotion by giving her Boaz as a husband and by providing her with a son, Obed, the grandfather of David. It's a rather stunning story even if you're following it just in that day and time. Because it leaves me wondering, wondering what it would have been like to have been a Moabite entering Bethlehem. It's a small town, small hamlet in Israel. Small town, everybody knows everybody else's business. You know what small towns are like. It's the kind of town where over the back fence, one neighbor says to the other about the story that's going around, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And the neighbor says, I've already told you more than I know. <laughs> it's that kind of place. That kind of town where in one house a person sneezes, in the next house they say, bless you. Everybody knows everybody's business. And so they talk. You see who's come to town? A Moabite. A Moabite right here in Beth. What was it that Moses said? It makes me wonder what it would have been like. The behind-the-scenes conversations. What did they say to Naomi? What did they say to Ruth? What did they say to her face? What did they say behind her back? What was it like? Because the truth is, when somebody different then us comes in. We tend to be standoffish, suspicious, a bit threatened. Who are you? Really? Hmm. The message is you don't belong. Where did you say you're from? Moab? Huh. Yeah, I've heard of Moab. Interesting. What did they say to Ruth? How did they treat her? It's so easy to draw those lines. We draw them well in many different ways. You know what it's like, white and black, Asian, Hispanic, Republican, Democrat, wealthy, poor, educated, not educated, part of the in crowd, not part of the in crowd, Adventist, not Adventist, liberal, conservative. We can go on and on with the lines we draw, the distinctions we make, and the people who are not welcome. Not here. Makes me think of the African-American pastor, writer, speaker, Edward Gilbreth, 
He has been called by the well-known Christian writer Philip Yancey, the gentle prophet. I want to read you something that Gilbreth wrote some years ago. He writes, It was my third year in the ministry. I got a call from a prominent white Christian leader asking me to go to lunch with him. As we're sitting down to eat, all of a sudden this guy starts crying. He explained that God had blessed him. His children were healthy. He was known throughout the country. But he said, I've had a hard time sleeping through the night. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, why is he telling me this? I'm not a therapist. I just came back from an annual conference on the other side of the country, the man told me. A bunch of us got together to discuss reconciliation and cross-cultural ministry. Usually, he said, when black leaders come into the meeting, we make them feel right at home and let them be part of the decision-making process. But to be honest with you, the decisions are made before your leaders ever get there. I'm used to hearing the jokes the use of the N-word. But this time when the jokes were going on and people were saying things, it didn't sound right to me. How can I get over this, the leader asked me, sobbing. How can we be friends? I was silent for a moment. And then I asked him, do you like football? He seemed a little puzzled. When he asked me, but I said, yes, I do. I do too, he said. I used to coach high school and college ball, and I have a lot of friends who play pro. I love a good game, and I love to cook out. So here's what we do. I need to get to know you, and you need to get to know me. Why don't you come over to my house? I was the only black in my suburban neighborhood at the time. I said, bring your wife and meet my wife, and we'll just sit and talk and get to know each other. I'll barbecue some steaks, and let's start there. He was taken aback. He said, you mean you want me to come to your house? Yes, I said. If you want me to sit here and clear your conscience for all the garbage you did, I can't do that. Friendship is not cheap. It takes time and commitment. I gave him my phone number and told him to give me a call. I never heard from him again. It's hard. Somebody from the other side of the tracks, the other side of town, the other side theologically, the other side culturally, racially, it's hard to join together, to be one in the body of Christ. It's hard. So as challenging as life must have been for Ruth from those on the outsides, what surprises me most is not her story in the book of Ruth. What surprises me most is her story in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew's Gospel, the place where Matthew starts out giving all the names. You know the names, the genealogy, the father of the father. The, the, the chapter that most of us in the modern world try to read and think, I, I don't get, why is all this here? I don't even know these people. No person in Matthew's world would have said that because it was the introduction of a person of pure heritage. It was done with prophets. It was done especially with priests. It was done with people at large. We are part of the chosen people. Even more importantly, with this baby Jesus born in Bethlehem, it was critical because of the claims to royal lineage. He had to have pure pedigree. And so we read Matthew 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amenadab, the father of Naashan, Naashan, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. 
Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth the Moabite? Ruth the enemy? Ruth of the people who are never to be in the assembly of God? That Ruth? Not only is she living in Bethlehem, now she has become an ancestor of the Messiah. Ruth? Things get hard when Ruth shows up. And yet remember, she is the ancestor of this baby, this baby who will grow up to break down barriers and to open doors. This baby who will preach an eloquent sermon on the water of life to an audience of one, and she a woman of Samaria. This baby who will grow up to cast the demoniac out of the Gadarene man on the other side from Israel. This baby who will grow up to heal the son of the Roman centurion. This baby who will grow up to reward the faith of the Canaanite woman who keeps clamoring and saying things like, but Lord, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs. That's this baby. He will grow up to champion a message that throws the door of God's kingdom open to any who will come. That's this baby with his great, 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 however many greats, grandmother, the Moabite woman. And don't think for a minute that this baby will be the only one to herald that message. Because he will have an apostle, an apostle who came late, born out of season, as he would say himself, named Paul. And Paul would pick up the torch for the Gentiles, for the outsiders, for those on the other sides of the tracks. And he would say, they are drawn into the kingdom of God just as certainly as are we, the chosen people. I want to read you, it's about 10 or 11 verses long, but I want to read you what I would consider the Mount Everest of statements in Scripture regarding this issue penned by Paul to the church in ancient Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. But I want to read it to you out of Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, The Message. I think he captures so well the essence of what Paul is trying to communicate. So listen to what Paul wrote. Remember, he's now speaking at this part of his letter to the Gentiles, to the Ruths of his day. He says, It was only yesterday that you outsiders to God's ways had no idea of anything of this, didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel, hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. Now because of Christ, dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it altogether are in on everything. The Messiah has made things up between us so that we're now together on this, both Jewish, non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall we used to keep each other at a distance. He repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. Then he started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created one new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. 
You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name as, of Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. He used apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone stone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day. A holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. It's a stellar statement saying that God can take the roots of our lives and draw them in to participate with us who have been blessed with his message. And that then God takes those lives and together with one another, he begins to build a habitation that is made up even of those who were once rejected, excluded, and told, you don't belong. Now, don't think it was easy. I've noticed that we tend to think that the early church had an easy time of that. That they were all together in one accord and that characterized their common life. Anyone who believes that has not read Acts or the different epistles of Paul. It was profoundly difficult. Just as difficult as the story we read of the African-American pastor saying to the white Christian leader, you've got to come over. We've got to be friends if we're going to fix this. It was just that hard and maybe harder in the early church. Trying to make one church out of two groups of people. In fact, I'd like to read you a letter. It's a fictional letter, but it's very true to the day and time of which it is written. It's a letter written by a seminary graduate, Michelle Winger. As she came out of her seminary studies, as she came out of studying about the early church and the bringing together of Jew and Gentile into one new body, she decided, I need to write something that might reflect just how challenging that would have been. And so Winger sat down and wrote a letter as though written from a daughter to her mother, a Jewish daughter to her Jewish mother, both of whom had named the name of Christ and were now disciples of his, but were still very much living in their Jewish Jewish identity. This is the letter. Dearest Mama, I am half joyful, half heart sick, and turn to you for help in this time of upheaval and hope. At first, I feared this conflict stemmed from my own sinful pride, that I, a Jewish wife and mother, have always kept a clean, kosher home. Now, because our Messiah Jesus has come, I'm expected to let little Sarah play and study with Diana, our pagan neighbor child, because she too has Jesus, although it seems to be in her own way. It's more than pride, it's conscience. We have struggled for centuries to keep the law, to be pure, to please Yahweh, and here this little child simply believes and is accepted into God's kingdom. Nothing in her is Jewish except her Messiah. Knowing the resurrected Christ Jesus as my Messiah, having the joy of His Spirit within me has given me such peace, yet excitement, that I can hardly contain it. I hurry to share this good news with the butcher, the milkman, and anyone who will listen. Why then is it almost painful to open my heart and doors and release my child to the goyim, the Gentile outsider? to let her play with their pagan toys and eat their snacks. I'm truly happy that the Holy Scriptures have been fulfilled, not just for us, but for them as well. But here's the rub. That is so much spiritual talk, while it is on the practical level that I ache. We have been taught not so much as to enter a Gentile's home. And now it feels that I am breaking vows and a way of life that defined who I was, letting it all go to become who I am in Christ my Messiah. I can hardly bear it. Can you help me, your loving daughter? 
Don't make the mistake of thinking that it was easy to welcome Ruth. The Moabite, the outsider, the one who Moses has said never belonged here. But remember, the nativity scene with the babe in the manger and with the genealogy rising up behind him brings us face to face with that in our own lives. So who is your Ruth? Who is that person about which you say, it is so hard. I can't invite her in. I can't give her of what's mine. Give her my will. I can't do that. Who is it for you? Person of a different ethnicity, a different culture, a different color, a different language. Who is it? A person of a different religious faith, a different world religion. Who is it? A different denomination, a person who happens to see things differently within Adventism than you do. Who is your Ruth? And what might Jesus be calling you to do in that person's life? Because when we're different than others, we're tempted to take it step by step in a bad direction. You see, different becomes wrong. And then wrong becomes bad. And then bad becomes excluded. And then excluded becomes God doesn't want anything to do with you. And then that becomes our own spiritual pride. This is our own small town. This is Bethlehem. What's the Moabitess doing here? Who is your Ruth? There's something very interesting to me about this book. Here's what it is if you read the first volume of the book called Genesis. It won't take you very long at all to come to God's promise to Abraham. Abraham, I will make you a blessing to all nations. Not just one. All nations. And then if you go over and you read the last volume in this book, called Revelation. You will hear the cry of an angel flying in midair, the first of three, who has the eternal gospel to preach to whom? To every nation, tribe, language, and people. So there you have it. At the beginning, at the end, the first and the last, the alpha, the omega, this is for everybody. But then if you read the middle part, that big part, so much fighting goes on about who gets included and who gets excluded. That's much of the story of the book. Forgetting that it begins and ends with God's call to every Ruth who will listen. Come. You who were not my people, you are now my people. You, have been, you who have been rejected, you are now included. And so it leaves us asking, who is the Ruth in our life, your life, and mine? For to whoever that Ruth may be, we need to make certain that the call and the song of the church of this Church is clear. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Gracious God, forgive us for our small mindedness, our hard heartedness, our exclusivity. Lord, let us never close the door to those for whom God has opened it. Let us never say no to those to whom God has said yes. And never, never let us 
be so concerned about us that we forget to love them. In the name of Jesus, amen. And another happy hello to all of you who join us Sabbath by Sabbath at this greeting time. And yes, I have another list of wonderful folks right at the top of my list. Listen up, everybody, is Trace Salerno, Spokane, Washington. Yes, he is my grand nephew. And there he is. And you're seeing him with his family also. They are so special in so many people's lives. Thank you, Julia, for sending us word about Trace's birthday. And next on my list is Michelle and Scott Cady, two other very special people in lots of lives and in my life too, because I got to stand up with them 28 years ago at their wedding. And there they are, and look at their beautiful daughters. Congratulations, Scott and Michelle. And what can I say about this next person? You know him. All of you know him. Stu Hardy. There he is with his sons. There he is with his darling wife, Linda. They're my children, actually. And as we see him all the time with Joel here at church. Warmest congratulations, Stu, for your birthday. And Betty Adams. We've had the privilege of seeing Betty before, but now she's having another birthday up there at Placerville. And I want to wish you, Betty, a very happy birthday. And we see you there with faithful husband, Fred. God bless. And Shirley Rendell. I haven't seen you for a while, but I'm reminded it's your birthday. And so I'm here to wish you the very, very best for this special birthday. And Linda Graham. Essex, England. Thank you for joining us across the water. Happy birthday to Linda Graham. And hello, Judy. Judy Vidella and Gabe. I'm so glad to be reminded of you folks. And we get to talk once in a while, but now I get to say happy birthday, Judy Vidella. And look at these folks, Martha and Richard Squire, Mayaguez, Puerto Rico. We're so glad to be in touch with you year after year. And it's your birthday, Martha, and your anniversary, you two. We see them there early on, and we see them today. God bless you. Congratulations. Hello, Dr. John Scharfenberg. You are so special in so many lives, mine too, and to think you are marking your 95th birthday. 
best congratulations, and we're always glad to see you. Keep going, Dr. Scharfenberg and Lee Jackra over in Mesa, Arizona. Hello, Lee. So glad to be reminded of your birthday. And I'm here to say happy birthday, Lee Jackra. And look at this guy. Talk about blue eyes, huh? Bill Gerber up in uh, British Columbia. Actually, they live in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And he's active at the Hope Camp in British Columbia. And there he is with dear Bonnie and other members of the family too are very close to Bill. Congratulations, Bill, on your special birthday. Hello, Herb Fevick up at the village in Portland. Glad to be reminded that you're having birthdays too. And I'm so grateful. And I'm here to wish you the very best, Brother Herb, for your birthday. And look at Michael Patterson. We miss you on the kind of regular basis you used to be here, but you're still a part of this family, Michael, and so glad to see you and your mom and your sister, and I wish you happy birthday in your setting with Giovanni, your teacher and your colleague, and see you active with your music. God bless. Hello, Pedro Payne. Peter Payne, right here at Loma Linda University Medical Center, running the Possibilities Program, and that is so important. And I see you there with one of the special ladies in your life. Congratulations, Pedro, on your birthday. And next on my list is Margaret Yanag Gahara. Hello, Margaret, over at the villa. Glad to be reminded it's your birthday, and I'm here to say congratulations. As to also Olympsia Boyd over in Brooklyn, New York. Hello, Olympsia. Happy birthday to you. Wish I had a picture. Congratulations anyway. And Harriet Eckern, also right here at the villa. Hello, Harriet. Happy birthday to you, dear. And also a happy birthday goes to Leroy Wyatt over there in Shadron, Nebraska. Always glad to be in touch with you folks and glad to know it's your birthday, Leroy, and I wish you the very best. And Bill Shasky, Dr. Shasky, right here in Loma Linda. And uh, you have such a great view of this whole valley and I'm glad to call attention to you on your birthday, Bill, and wish you the very, very best. And Barbara Wareham, dear Barbara, and Dr. Ellsworth, so glad to know it's your birthday, Barbara, and I'm here to wish you the very best and enjoy the picture of you and Dr. Wareham and also the picture of you and son, Dr. Wareham, and other parts of your family. Hello, Bernard and Alana Taylor. So glad to have you people in our family here at Loma Linda University Church. And now you're marking, I think, your 52nd wedding anniversary. And I just want to say warmest congratulations and best blessings to all of us as we are in this special Christmas season. <music> 